So we're going to change direction slightly here with this next session. We're focusing on connecting tech ecosystems between Australia and our ASEAN neighbours to see how we can best leverage our networks to connect Australian businesses into the ASEAN market. We're sitting down with Mark Kostowski, Chief Executive Officer of Creative Enterprise Australia, or CEA, part of the Queensland University of Technology based in Brisbane. CEA is a creative industries and tech incubator, accelerator, co-working space and investment fund, home to over 80 creative startups and entrepreneurs. Mark has worked with innovative, fast growth and creative businesses for over 15 years within both the private and public sectors and has designed, developed and delivered accelerator style programs for Australian businesses nationally and internationally. Mark is a true advocate for developing and forging links with Australia and Southeast Asia tech ecosystems and for the past several years, CEA has led the Australian contingent of startups to the TechSource Global Summit, a technology and innovation conference in Bangkok. Thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Firstly, can you tell us a bit more about CEA? What do you do and how do you support and help build great tech businesses? Sure. Uh, Creative Enterprise Australia, or CEA, is an innovation hub based in Brisbane, um, but we actually have a mandate to support um, startup tech businesses and now growth businesses across all of Australia. We do work with, um, we are owned by the university, but we're a private company, so for a for-profit company where we manage and run um, three separate style investment funds from pre-seed through to uh, syndicated series A. Um, we run a number of accelerator programs in the FMCG food, tech and fashion space. And we run a series of masterclass events, program initiatives, startup weekends to support and grow the innovation and startup community across Australia and in Brisbane. Uh, and, and to do all of that, we work with a wide community across the country. Um, we started off uh, over 10 years ago looking primarily at supporting creative businesses in the fields of what we classify as creative tech, which are things like multimedia, AR, VR, music tech, marketing tech, um, advertising tech. But we've expanded more recently into um, a number of other categories, so fast-moving consumer goods, food, um, consumer health. And so we're very, very much broadening our scope um, to, to play a role in supporting the ecosystem more widely in Australia. Uh, we do work with both um, alumni and innovators from within the university, but we have a number of um, investments and program initiatives across the whole country. So we have a scope to support the innovation community across the whole country. And like many of the community hubs and the innovation hubs, we work closely with a lot of other groups to, um, to do that. We've, we've had a bit of a focus, a primary focus, on really building the bridges across into the ASEAN region over the last three years. It's the fastest growing middle class on the planet, um, and it's one of the closest partners for us that is often overlooked by the startup and the growth ecosystems in Australia. So if we have a look at what's happening in the US and the UK or Europe, there are a lot of services and a lot of groups supporting growth activities into those regions, but very few supporting activities into the ASEAN region. So if we sort of take a line from Vietnam and draw it right down to India, Indonesia and that region, there's around about 700 million people that populate that part of the world, um, all fast growing um, economies, all sort of with GDPs of between four and 6%. And so we're really looking at ways in which we can work closely with collaborators and stakeholders and innovation ecosystems, financiers in those regions, and help take Australian startups and Australian growth businesses both into those areas, but also take a lot of those businesses and corporates that work in those regions and parts of the world and bring them to Australia to help build those bridges. Uh, and there's only one way to do that, and that's very actively. Awesome. Thank you. So one thing I really like about CEA is that you incorporate the Asian Immersion Week as part of your Collider Accelerator program. You touched on this just before, but I think it's often easier for startups to gravitate to more well-known or familiar markets like the US, UK and Europe. Can you explain what international role does CEA play for the startups in your network and the broader innovation ecosystem with building a global reputation for Australian creative tech startups? So CEA has been playing a, a key role internationally um, for a number of years. For the last uh, six years, we've been the Australian host of the Creative Business Cup, which is a global pitching competition for creative startups where the finals take place in Denmark every year. And we've had a number of our um, startups go and represent Australia in Denmark uh, since 2015. Um, last year, we had uh, one of our startups actually make the top the top five, I believe it was, for the first time, which was a great outcome. So we've been doing that um, regularly. For the previous couple of years as well, we've partnered with Virgin Startup in the UK. We've actually had Australian creative tech startups take part in the Step Up program, uh, which is part of the growth program at Virgin Startup. And so that's been quite an exciting initiative for us also. But, but we've really focused on the ASEAN region and part of that is really aligning and creating 
a large component or a large um, uh, group or activities into Bangkok specifically as part of the TechSource Global Summit, which is one of the largest tech events in the region that attracts between 17 and 20,000 people every year. And so what we've done is we've actually built a whole week within our Collider Accelerator, which is a 12-week accelerator where we invest um, capital into startups and we take them over into the region. And we do that for a number of reasons. One is to build networks um, and build channels for startups going in market, although we do understand that in an in, in, in an accelerator program, the startups probably aren't going to be ready to be trading internationally right away. The main reason we take startups over into a region like Bangkok, which is a very fast growing startup region, is to expose them to the, sp to the pace and the ferocity at which a very fast growing ecosystem is moving. And also exposes the founders to like type, type founders in the region to show them the tenacity they require to be competitive on a global scale. Um, and, and that's really to make sure that when they come back here to Australia, they continue to have that mindset of having to grow global quickly. We can become a little bit um, lethargic sometimes in Australia because we are in a, a comfortable environment and a very comfortable um, economy, but exposing startups at an early stage to economies that are highly progressive, interacting quickly, very, very competitive is probably a very, very good thing for us to be doing. And we find the TechSource Global Summit as a three-day event and then all of the activities we build around that a great way to do that. So we actually take out the Australian Startup Pavilion at the TechSource Global Summit. Last year, we took along the 10 startups that were in the Accelerator along with about another 10 startups or growth companies um, from the Queensland ecosystem um, in a number of areas, which included FMCG, MedTech, and, and others, um, and we expose them to the whole gamut of activities that happen in Thailand. Uh, we also organise one-on-one -on -one meetings with key partners. So we had startups meeting with multinationals like Tencent, um, the Thailand Tourism Authority, and others to really start to understand what they need to do to build their business to, businesses to become customers of these mega, mega companies that sit across the ASEAN region. Um, we're also building a lot of those channels to try and bring the corporates that exist in the region um, back into Australia. So. In areas like Thailand specifically, um, venture capital is made up 90% of corporates and 10% of the private uh, private industry, whereas in Australia, it's the opposite. It's 90% private and 10% corporate. So what we're trying to do is build channels to actually bring a lot of that corporate venture back into Australia that exists in the region and to put a little bit of pressure on the corporates that exist here in Australia who perhaps aren't quite as active as they should be in supporting startups. And so over the next few years, we're really going to be looking to strengthen our ties with TechSource and the, the conference itself and a number of the key players there and bringing those corporates into Australia to one, inject capital, but two, to actually start to create a more competitive environment um, for the corporates in Australia to hopefully kick them along to start doing a little bit more actively as well. Great. Can you tell us a bit more about the partnerships that CEA has? So CEA have a number of partnerships that really help us um, magnify and amplify the activities we're doing in the region. In Thailand alone, we um, have a partnership with the National Innovation Agency and Startup Thailand, which is a public sector organisation responsible for supporting the startup community. So for Startup Thailand and the NIA, we've actually been delivering a number of programs for startup founders in Thailand. And what we're finding in regions like Asia is that Australia has been really good for the last 15 years at developing and creating programs and initiatives that help build the knowledge of startup founders. But what we've been quite bad at is then commercializing and growing those at a global scale. So where we, when we start to link up with the ASEAN region, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, um, and Malaysia, what we can bring is actually a lot of knowledge and know-how on one, we, how, how we manage funds and venture funds, how we deliver accelerator programs, and how we build and nurture entrepreneurs through the process of ideation, commercialization, and building a company. What we get from that is, from what, what we get from the Asian ecosystem is huge capital markets and huge consumer markets. So as I mentioned earlier, over 700 million people that exist within the region and very, very large amounts of corporate venture capital that exists. So we can take our knowledge and expertise into the region with the maturity of programs we have, which are hugely beneficial for organizations like the National Innovation Agency and Startup Thailand. But in doing so, we actually then bring a lot of the market to us, which is which is really beneficial. Some of the other relationships, as we mentioned, we'd had earlier are with Virgin Startup in the UK, where we've actually worked with the Virgin Group and taken startups into the Virgin Group, the Creative Business Cup in Denmark, where we've been working with enough for with for a number of years now to actually take startups into the European space. 
Um, but on the private side in the ASEAN region, working with TechSource Global Summit, working with Hubber, which is a very large co-working space there, um, and working with a number of the universities in the region to actually take what we're doing here at QUT and what we're doing in Australia from a theoretical perspective into the universities to help them nurture entrepreneurs that they're identifying early on, but don't necessarily have a means to support them. So really working with public sector agencies, working with the private sector and corporates and working with universities has been a very successful way that we've been able to move in market, gain trust and actually develop programs and initiatives. Thanks, Mark. So creative and creative tech is quite a unique industry sector we have here in Australia. And it's creating a new wave of businesses that are different to our traditional, more well-known industries like, say, mining and agriculture. What are your thoughts on Australia's comparative advantage globally in the creative tech space? And how do you see this as one of Australia's key industries moving forward? So one of the reasons CEA is really focused on the creative industries and, and what we define as creative tech is because it's it's one of the quiet giants of our own economy. Um, it represents over 6% of the workforce in Australia. It's over $2 billion in GDP um, and has hundreds of thousands of businesses across Australia. And what we're seeing in countries like Thailand, Vietnam and Malaysia are very, very, very strong creative industries and creative tech ecosystems where they can learn significantly from Australia's um, experiences. So we have um, an, 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 we're overcapitalized in successful stories, whether we win, whether we're winning Emmys or Oscars or our acting um, film industry is globally recognized. I mean, most recently, Bluey the Dog, I think it was won an Emmy again. Um, and so Australia is seen as a very, very forward thinking com- country when it comes to media, um, TV, entertainment. And what we're seeing is the explosion of that across the ASEAN region now, but in digital format and in a format that is non-traditional. And so what we're really looking to do is identify ways and connect the channels around ways in which we can help amplify that, not just for Australia and the traditional industries that we've done really well in here, um, in TV and film, but also across Asia. Um, and how do we do that? across music and marketing tech and a number of other areas. Um, And we're seeing some really interesting startups pop up at the moment that are doing great things in the TV and film space. Uh, And so we're we're wanting to really continue to support the development of the creative industries here, which are going to, as we move forward, represent a much larger part of our economy. And as we've seen um, over the last uh, four to six weeks with the the COVID situation, people working from home and looking for much more creative ways, one, to be entertained, but two, to work. Um, The rise of organisations like Canva, uh, we see Netflix being overloaded uh, and we're seeing e-commerce sites really starting to explode. How do we as a country take much better advantage of that and build more robust systems around our creative economy uh, that can move into the next the next generation? And so that's one of the reasons we focus on the creative ecosystem so strongly and why we're quite excited about what's happening in Asia uh, and the opportunities that exist in Asia across the region as well. So a couple of the really important areas that we need to work on as Australia to bring ourselves more closely aligned to the ASEAN region is that we need to build stronger um, relationships at a government level. So at the moment, we don't have very, very strong relationships if you look at the state level. So we have our Austrade offices, which do a great job in the regions, and we have our landing pads, which do a great job. Um, but they only have the ability to touch or work with so many entrepreneurs or so many institutions. We really do need much stronger collaboration at a state level to amplify the activity that's taking place. Um, So whether it's the Queensland government, New South Wales, Victorian governments, we want to see more program activity working at a state by state level. But really what's important is working with corporates and community. So we can work more closely with corporates in the regions, um, with the banks, with the the supermarket chains, with the other providers and start to bring and create those relationships. It's, It's very important. Um, that we start to do that more um, efficiently. So there's a lot of people doing things in a scattergun approach, but it's not necessarily coordinated and we need to do a better job at that. And that's where we've actually had a lot of help from Austrade in the Bangkok office, working with a number of the partners there that have helped us really align the activities and work uh, to amplify a lot of what we're doing. Great. So based on your experiences, which you have mentioned already, from a startup industry perspective, what do you see are the strongest areas of opportunities in terms of tech collaboration and connecting ecosystems more broadly between ASEAN and Australia? So the best way in which we can look to really start to connect our tech ecosystems up is we have to 
form and force activities together. So at CEA, we've been delivering a number of activities where we take delegations over into Asia and embedding those delegations over in the Asian ecosystem. We actually also um, hosted a delegation from Thailand of startups over here to Australia uh, and took them on a tour of the Australian ecosystem. And those activities are really good, but we need more. And so what we've been really looking to do is identifying what happens over in Asia that is really successful that we can bring to Australia? And what are we doing here in Australia that is really successful that we can take into Asia? And we've been talking to um, the founders of the TechSource Global Summit, which really is probably the largest event or conference in the region at the moment of its kind. It's, it's over 80 countries that actually go in and spend three days together in Bangkok. And it, there's very few conferences you can go to in the world where you get exposure to that number of companies, uh, com countries and companies. And so we know that um, earlier this year, in January 2020, TechSource had its first regional event in Johor Bahru in um, Malaysia. And so uh, a few of us went over there to participate and take part in that. And that was a way in which the, the TechSource group are taking their networks into other countries. And so we've been having some discussions on what it might look like to bring an event or conference of that calibre to Australia. Because at the moment in Australia, we have a lot of Australian events that really focus in Australia and only within the same, same Australian bubble, that's great to build a community, but it doesn't do a lot to build awareness globally. And we need to do a much better job at building awareness globally about what we do. And the best way to do that is to attract international entities, international groups that are doing these great activities and bring them here to Australia. So if in five years time, I could say um, that we had been successful in bringing an arm of the TechSource Summit to Australia, not just TechSource, but bringing all of those international corporates to Australia so they can see what's happening here, I think um, I could probably feel like we've done a really good job at helping build those ecosystems, communities and channels and collaborations between the countries, but we still have a lot more to do. And there's no one group that can do that by itself. It needs support and collaboration of government bodies, government entities, state governments and corporates to really, really want to do that. So whilst it's great, we have the events here like um, Code in Queensland, we have Pause Fest in Victoria, we have StartCon in um, New South Wales. We really need to start looking at what are the international activities and conferences we can bring bring here and form long-term relationships that are going to, one, build corporate relationships across um, country, build startup relationships across country, align our government agencies in building and creating policies that support growth across the countries and start to channel um, capital across both, both ASEAN and Australia as well. Thanks. Very valid points there, Mark. Thank you. And absolutely, I think the two-way exposure is really important. And I know CEA often hosts inbound delegations from ASEAN to Australia. And it's an important way to reciprocate the relationship by also inviting experts and the connections from overseas markets to visit Australia and understand the types of technology and expertise and opportunities that we have here. Can I get your perspective on how and why you think this is important? I mean, historically in Australia, what we've been doing is... Um, positioning ourselves as a country as the um, epicenter of the region. But unfortunately, I think uh, as we've progressed as an economy and as the region to our north being the ASEAN region, and certainly even the East Asian region has grown, we are no longer part of the discussion of their growth. So whether you look at China, India, Southeast Asia, uh, the ASEAN region in general, Australia is no longer part of the discussion as they grow and move towards um, a quaternary economy. And that's really a failing on Australia as a nation and what we've, the way we've positioned ourselves in the last 15 years and the way we've viewed and looked at Asia um, as sort of a developing um, ecosystem and group of countries that we don't have to worry about. They've almost gotten to the point where they've surpassed us on a GDP stage. They're certainly much faster growing than us. Um, and on a middle growing middle class stage, they're, they're progressing much more quickly than us. And the fear I have is that if we don't start to move actively into these regions as Australia and actually embed in these regions, as we're doing with the, Aust in the, with the Austrade offices and the landing pads, we're going to miss the boat completely on the growth of one of the last final frontiers of um, the global economy. So we essentially were, were far too um, early to be part of the US growth in the early 2000s and the late 90s. Europe happened... Um, a little bit later on, but we weren't progressed and mature enough to be part of the growth of there. And then we saw the explosion of Israel and the capital that went into Israel, particularly in the biotech space. And one of the last regions for growth that we can become part of is, is the ASEAN region. So Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, 
we can actively become part of that region by bringing value to it through the programs, initiatives, and understanding we have on how to build startup ecosystems and, and build fluid ecosystems. But they're not going to come to us anymore like we thought they used to. It's up to Australia and all of the stakeholders that exist in Australia to move into the region and actively try to become part of the region. And we really only have a finite amount of time to do this, three to five years maximum, before we're going to become an afterthought. And so it's very important that groups like CEA um, and others that are doing work in the region continue to do that, but continue to be supported to do that um, because it's not cheap, um, but it's really important for the Australian economy. And it's really important for us to support the international offices of Austrade and others that are there to actually amplify what we're doing. But I'm very passionate to say and very... Um, it's a very conscious decision to say that if we don't start to actively become part of the ASEAN region more wholly and more holistically um, with a long-term strategic plan, we're going to be an afterthought uh, and, and miss the boat on the growth of it, which will be a tremendous failure um, for Australia moving forward. Thanks. That's really good. You articulate those points really well. So thank you. My next question is, how do you think startups should leverage the industry accelerator connections and how can they get involved with attending TechSource along with the CEA cohort? So there are a number of ways that startups across the whole country can actually um, connect up with the industry accelerators and be part of a summit like TechSource Global Summit. And there are a lot of delegations that take place from Australia going into global markets. Um, for CEA, our Collider Accelerator is open to startups across the whole country if they're in what we call the creative tech space. But that's very broad in itself. So it includes AR, VR, machine learning, robotics, um, uh, consumer health, um, marketplace, marketing tech, music tech, it's very, very broad. So we do cohorts um, every year that we actually uh, will invest in and then take over into the ASEAN and TechSource Summit. We also open TechSource up to other startups that want to be part of the delegation. And so we'll be working with local and um, national uh, governments where they may want to bring other startups to become part of it. And we can build a whole component and syllabus around going into the, the Thai region, which is what we did last year. Um, there are a number of groups also that actually work closely in the ASEAN region um, across Australia. So um, it's worth looking out for those um, across the various startup hubs, uh, whether it's the Sydney Startup Hub or um, the hubs here in Brisbane or Melbourne, um, and looking at what, what groups are actually doing work like in ventures in Sydney, actually over in the regions. But but um, it, people are always welcome to reach out to CEA and reach out to our team and understand and identify what are we doing more. Uh, we just re we just finished one of Australia's largest startup weekends where we had facilitators flying from uh, Thailand, Indonesia, and our local facilitators, sorry, Thailand, Malaysia, and our local facilitators, which continue to bring those stakeholder networks over. Uh, we had all, over 200 participants pa uh, participate in that particular startup weekend, which was called NextGen um, back in March. So that was really successful. We'll continue to look to do things like that and that's open to people across the whole country as well there's also a startup weekend coming up in about two weeks time which is going to be one of the first virtual startup weekends run by Techstars, which CA is a part of which is around um, coronavirus and covid so there's around about 50 countries i think already taking part australia is a host country as well and ca is one of the organizations that is um, driving the australian side of things and so that's going to be a startup weekend which i believe runs on a tuesday wednesday thursday um, but is primarily involved in coming up with solutions around anything to do with COVID. And so that will be a world startup weekend where you can actually participate um, on the Australian arm of that. So you can uh, go onto the Techstars website or Startup Weekend website and find out more about that or reach out to CA and we can let you know more about that as well. But reaching out to the hubs where the hubs, the co-working spaces, the investment funds that already have relationships with the region are probably the fastest uh, and the most efficient way to think about moving into those spaces instead of having to build your own channels. Excellent. So to wrap up, what are your final practical pieces of advice to startups and tech companies that are looking to expand into ASEAN and your tips for making the most of TechSource or other similar industry conferences in the region? So the ASEAN region isn't necessarily like uh, Western countries when you're building relationships and particularly business relationships. Across much of the region, um, relationships need to be built on a personal level before a business level. So where, when you might be going to the US or Europe, you can go over with a, with a mindset that is transactional. You're here to sell X to Y. When you're going into the ASEAN region, and this certainly also includes China, um, it's very much around what is the relationship you need to build with the individual first before you start to talk about a transactional relationship. And that's often something that um, Australian companies get wrong. Uh, and to build those um personal relationships takes more time and takes more effort. It's not just something that's done in one trip. And so the, the advice I have is that when you're moving into a region like ASEAN, it's important to make multiple trips 
be introduced to people through trusted networks before you really try to go in for the hard sell. Um, and that's a very, very important point to make because it builds much longer lasting relationships than a single transaction. So they're very much built on trust and whether they like you as people and like the organization and what you do. And that's why we've spent a number of years building the relationships we've got across the ASEAN region now. Uh, and that's sort of a really important tip for a lot of startups. The other one is work through trusted parties. So whether it's groups already doing work there that can you can essentially leverage their guangxi or their relationship, it's worth doing that. Um, and work with government agencies like Austrade that has have offices in those regions and can provide the warm connections. Um, often underutilized resources, uh, a lot of those government entities and the landing pads. So I think taking advantage of advantage of the landing pads and the relationships that they have across the region are really important as well. Thank you again so much for your time today, Mark, your passion and enthusiasm for building connections and linkages between Australia and ASEAN tech ecosystems is incredibly insightful and inspiring. For those listening, if you want to know more about QTCA, visit their website at qtca.com or connect with Mark Kostowski on LinkedIn or at QTCA on Twitter. Thanks so much, Elisa. I really appreciate it.